Um, happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm just going to ask the kids from my Sabbath school to come up now, kids, if you like, and get into the order that you chose. A um, couple of weeks ago, come on, I uh, posed a question to them. I asked them when they think about God, what picture comes to mind? And so for the last couple of weeks, they've been working on some artwork to present to you guys of their picture of God and what comes to mind. And um, just while they're presenting it, think about it yourselves. When you think about God, what picture comes into your mind? Okay, Jesse, hold these up. When I think of God, the picture that comes to mind is light. First Timothy 6 verse 16 says, Who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light whom no one has seen or can see Jesse had trouble thinking of something didn't you the only thing that came to mind was light okay Chris has got a cool one okay when I think of God the picture that comes from my mind comes from Revelation 4 3 and the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper a rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Very good. That's our budding artist, I think. Okay, Ashley? When I think of God, the picture that comes to my mind are majestic mountains. It says in Psalms 76 verse 4, You are resplendent with light, more majestic than mountains. Okay, Jeremy, hold, come over here, Jeremy, a bit. That's it. Okay. When I think of God, the picture that comes to mind is a picture of heaven and what God is preparing for us. John 14, verse 2 says, In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go there, I go to prepare a place for you. Okay, Daniel, come forward. When I think of God, the words of a song come to my mind, and they are God's fingerprints are everywhere just to show how much he cares. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, uh, juniors, for those pictures of God this morning. Um, to begin this morning as a little bit of a segue, I want to share my picture of God. So, uh, juniors have inspired me. Unfortunately, I don't quite have the artistic ability that you do, so I'm going to use um, pictures. My picture of God is kind of behind the scenes. So this is Babbage, and eight weeks ago, he actually set a world record. He's a teddy bear. And the world record that he set is the highest ever skydive. Now, this is a legit story. This is not one of those weird pastor stories that they pull out and it's exaggerated. or It's, it's actually a factual story. I checked out dozens of um, news sites because I'm like, that's not a real story. Um, but Babbage, the teddy bear, actually holds the record for the highest ever skydive. Last year, a man, an adventurer named Felix Baumgartner, decided to break the record. And so he spent 30 million pounds and months of preparing. He went up in a hot air balloon to 24 miles and then skydived from there and set the world record. Very expensive, very dangerous, but he broke it. This year, a man named David Ackerman had two hobbies, small hot air balloons and teddy bears, and he decided to put the two together and take on Felix Baumgartner's world record. It cost him 300 pounds <laughs> and two days of programming um, the little radio, uh, Raspberry Pi computer chip that um, controlled it all. So Babbage got sent up to 29 kilometres, which happened to be 31 metres more than Felix Baumgartner last year, and then a little release device went off, and Babbage the teddy bear skydived from that and actually holds the world record. Now, you may be arguing in your mind, you're like, but it's a teddy bear, because we don't expect much from teddy bears. You know, teddy bears don't really do much, but here's what Babbage did do. He trusted his owner and put himself in his hands, and you could argue, David Ackerman... The owner did all the work, but you check all of the sites and the news reports, Babbage holds the world record. 
And that for me is a real good picture of God. God is behind the scenes and if we trust him and put ourselves in his hands, there's nothing he can't do through us. And the amazing thing is that we will get the record, we will get the credit, and yet God's done all the work through us. And I mean, that's our, that's our journey as Christians. You know, people see us, and yet it's all the work of God, sustaining us and blessing us and just working through us. And Babbage reminds me of that. He's just a humble teddy bear, but he owns the world record for the highest ever skydive. And, um, but David Ackham and his owner behind is my picture of God. So thank you, Juniors, this morning. And excuse to throw up um, some uh, recent, a recent world record setting thing. This morning, before we get into the word, I just want to um, say a big thank you for the chance to be here once again. I do count a real privilege. Um, I, I do have a busy schedule, I think. In today's world, everybody's busy. And um, so, you know, part of the rat race. But I would hate to be too busy to be able to come and just enjoy a Sabbath um, around the, the different regions in our North Island Conference. And so I do count a real privilege to be here this morning. And um, it's great to see a lot of friendly uh, faces, but also old people get to catch up with, um, which is just great. And for me, it's a real blessing. I also want to just um, take the opportunity to acknowledge the, the journey of the Pram family over the last few weeks. Um, so kind of I was there... Just after it happened, I was actually on the teen expedition, and um, just Grant was right. There were so many incredible movements of God. Like um, I would never argue that God caused the accident, but there was so much around it where God was stepping in, going, "I will redeem this bad thing," and that's that's the Savior we serve. He will take whatever the devil tries to do, and he will bring it around to something good, or just you know help it turn out better than we could ever imagined. And um, there were just again so many. Incredible things that happen just around there. Um, but I do want to acknowledge Grant and Gaylene. Um, to have your son injured like that is one of the hardest things for parents. And I thank you as church family, um, just the prayers and the support for them and the anointing and the different things that members of this church have um, just helped support the family and Kyle with. Um, it was amazing just seeing the Pram family shine, even at the time. Sam, Sam stood out for me, the cousin with the biggest heart. He was just, if anyone was more upset, he was just like, no, that's my cousin. And um, so just acknowledge Sam's big heart for his cousin. Matthew's more stoic. So he was just like, no, it's going to be all right. He does this all the time. He's had um, other injuries. <laughs> Um, but you could tell that was coming from a big brother's heart and again was just more stoic, but again, that's more Matthew. Um, but you know, these guys really cared and it was just cool to see that big pram heart come out when Kyle got hurt. Um, so just, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I know I'll continue to pray for Kyle and the family, but again, as church, just thank you for being a supportive family. And just want to acknowledge that we don't come to church because everything's good. There are times when we need the support of each other. And um, I just want to acknowledge the, the hard journey that the Pram family have been through the last few weeks. Um, also just want to acknowledge, it's quite hard. I know Andrew West as the leader, our Pathfinder director for our conference and organizer of the teen expedition, um, he was beside himself when he knew that the injury had happened. Um, it's hard for a leader. And myself being there as a, a minister and as somebody who's been involved in ministry for young people for years we, we're in this because we want to see young people grow and meet Christ and have the best for them and to see a young person that seriously dinged up it really does rattle you because it's the opposite of what you're actually in ministry for for young people and I know Andrew was just really rattled and um, again myself being there I was just like no this is not supposed to happen you know this is not why we do ministry for young people and put on things so um yeah, if you see Andrew also, just encourage him. I know he's still um, kind of just, yeah, really, yeah, bit of a ding for him as well. This morning as we get into the Word, I just invite you to, to uh, bow your heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that we get the opportunity this morning to come together as church family. We thank you that you have knit us into a community of faith, and this is where we are encouraged and supported we thank you this is where we get to share joy, we get to share smiles, we get to share life. And Lord, I pray for a greater knitting of your Holy Spirit, a greater outpouring of forgiveness and grace and love and understanding, 
greater outpouring of your strength and all of those wonderful things you promise. And thank you, Lord, that this is just the smallest foretaste, an imperfect foretaste of heaven, of an eternity with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. But Lord, we thank you that you don't just call us together for each other, you call us together for you. And Lord, this morning, we would love your word to speak to us, whether it encourages us or challenges us or simply informs us or just moves us. Lord, whatever you need your word to do this morning, we ask that the Holy Spirit speak to each one of us and may we just be receptive to acknowledging you, worshiping you, glorifying you, and learning from you this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the greatest modern scourges must be road rage. Now, I'm sure that's not quite as true here in Whangarei as it is in Auckland, but still you would have um, heard you know, stories of people taking their stress and their frustrations and their life disappointments out on other motorists. We hear these and we tisk and we shake our heads at such ridiculous episodes of anger, impatience and violence. And we wonder, why can't people just chill out and get along? And yet, isn't there nothing worse than when you're running late and every slow moving, no indicating, erratic handling, crazy driving, logic defying, red light running, lane hopping, zigzag maneuvering, rear end encouraging, asleep at the wheel steering and no license holding driver happens to be out and about on every road you need to take to get to your destination. And how do we respond? Well, we usually get a little bit angry, a little bit frustrated and sometimes quite irate. But we don't like to call it road rage when it comes to us, because it's different when it's us. It's easy to make excuses for our poor behavior, because we believe that we are more important than anyone else on the road. We like to hold everyone else to one set of standards and rules and expectations, but we like everyone to hold us to a slightly lesser rate. We want people to excuse us and to find our excuses acceptable. And it's amazing how many excuses we can use. And I think this is particularly true when it comes to God. In fact, I think the prime time when excuses get pulled out is on a Sabbath morning as we enter the doors of church. Is there no greater time when the excuses just seem to flow? We step inside church and immediately we shake our hand and we're like, um, yeah, look, I'm sorry I'm a little bit late to church uh, this morning, but, you know, the thing happened with the thing back at the thing. And then immediately we sit and we're like, yeah, no, I didn't get the chance to study my lesson this week because, you know, the thing happened with the thing because of the thing. And then we see somebody we promised to pray for and we're like, oh, I didn't pray for them at all. And we're like, but that's all right because I got, you know, the thing happened with the thing and the thing. And then we see some visitors and we're like, oh, I need to go and talk to them. But no, no, not this week because of the thing and the thing and the thing. And there's somebody I've got a grudge against and I know I'm supposed to forgive them. But no, not this week because I'm still thinking of the thing that happened with the thing and the thing. And, and then the Holy Spirit places something on our hearts. And we're like, Lord, I know I'm supposed to be here and be receptive to you, but not this week because of the thing and the thing and the thing. There seems to be no greater prime time for excuses than when we step foot inside church. So many excuses. We know what God wants, and we expect everyone else to follow him, but it's different when it comes to us, because we have some good excuses. So this morning, let me ask, what's your excuse. What holds you back from trusting God and living the full life he promises? What holds you back from doing everything God asks you to, forgiving others, loving others, helping others? What stops you giving full access to every area of your life to the Holy Spirit? What stops you placing yourself in God's hand and trusting him? Imagine what living a life in God without any excuses might look like. No excuses. I think one of the most common excuses that we use 
And this is in everyday life. And this is a good excuse. This is one of the few genuinely good excuses. And that is at the end of a meal. We're at the table. And if we have finished before anyone else, then usually we will say, excuse me, or you will ask to be excused. This is a good excuse. It's a social obligation. What it does is it acknowledges the person who made the meal. It acknowledges the company we're with. But it also acknowledges that we want to do something else before everyone else leaves. And so we excuse ourselves from a social obligation by going, excuse me, thanks for the meal, but I've got something else to do. Good excuse. But when we put that into a spiritual reality, something changes. Because here's the spiritual reality. God has invited us to his table, to his feast, to his blessings, to his way and to his goodness. We sit at God's table and there's no better place to be. So why do we constantly get up and excuse ourselves from his feast? What is the something else we keep on insist on doing? What is more important than receiving everything God has to offer us? What's our excuse? A couple of months ago, I was personally um, challenged by the power of excuses. Um, I was somewhere in Matthew 17, 20 was shared. If you've got your Bibles, I invite you to open them. If you've got um, smartphones, tablets, um, wherever you get your Word of God from this morning, the bigger font on the data project screen, or if you have the world's best memory, please turn there now. So wherever you source your Word of God from, but we'll um, try and make sure it ends up um, in our hearts in a place that God can use it this morning. Always, where it ends is always more important than when we get it from. So Matthew 17, 20 was shared. One of the most famous little challenges by Jesus to his disciples. His disciples have just not been able to do something. And here's what Jesus says to them in Matthew 17, verse 20. Interesting enough, he actually shares almost word for word the exact same challenge four chapters later in Matthew 21 for those who... So very important. Here's what Jesus says. You don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Familiar words. This is one of, I guess, those big grand statements of Jesus. Smallest amount of faith, nothing will be impossible for you. Mountains will move. And I've heard this for years, and you know, you're always at that point, you're just like, "Mm mm-hmm, oh, powerful words of Jesus. Oh, I love it, you know, just the power of what Jesus offers. But a couple of months ago, I was in a sermon, and again, it got shared, and something struck me for the first time. Something happened for the first time. I started wrestling with this passage. I did the initial shaking and like, "Mm mm-hmm, praise the Lord. And then something said, but how could Jesus say that? Like, he's saying that you can move mountains. Like, what a crazy, irresponsible thing to say. And my mind suddenly started reveling this and going, well, no, I I, I don't know if I can take Jesus at his word here. Like, something in me just started going, but this is crazy. This is irresponsible. And all these excuses started coming to my mind for what Jesus might really be saying. And initially I was like, well, maybe this was just for the early disciples. Maybe they needed mountain-moving faith to, you know, begin Christianity. So maybe this was just for them. But it wasn't just for them. This is a universal statement of Jesus. And then I thought, well, maybe this isn't needed today. Maybe this isn't for our time. But again, it's a universal statement. If it's good for then, it's still good now. Jesus is not locking this into a time and place. And then I thought, maybe it's just a metaphor. It's one of those parts in the word that's a metaphor. But Jesus isn't saying if you had something like faith, you could move something like a mountain. He's been quite literal here. And then I thought, well, maybe I, can't, I could never have, you know, he's talking about a great amount of faith. Maybe I could never have that. So that's why it doesn't apply to me. But he's talking about the smallest amount of faith you can possibly have. He's inviting everyone into this experience because he's talking about the smallest amount of faith, not the biggest. 
And then I'm like, well, maybe all the mountains have been moved throughout the centuries, the last couple of uh, thousand years. And so maybe mountains don't need be, to be moved anymore because by faith, all the mountains that need moving have been moved. And so now, you know, just we're okay to not move mountains because they're all in the right place. Like I'm just trying to find anything to not take Jesus at his word. And I suddenly realized that that wasn't the point. In fact, something struck me more than anything, which was that for me, and I think for many of us, the mountain that needs moving is actually disbelief over what Jesus is saying right there. We often think of mountains as being literal mountains outside. And yet I think in a passage like this, he's talking about mountains of disbelief in us that need moving. And the smallest amount of faith will allow that. And is there no greater statement than this very one for where disbelief just rises in us? And we use excuses to not take Jesus at his word. Moving mountains. When it comes to God, our excuses water down what he says, who he is, and what he wants for us. You see, right is still right, wrong is still wrong, no matter how good our excuses are. Excuses don't change right and wrong or change the line before them. Excuses simply excuse us from true living. Excuses excuse us from the life God calls us to. Excuses are used to explain something away, to justify not doing something, to try to be forgiven for an offense, to defend ourselves, or to make allowances for wrong actions. So when it comes to God, when we use excuses, here is how it all gets unpacked. We try to explain away what he actually says. We are trying to get out of doing what he says. We're trying to offer reasons for getting off the hook for disobeying him. We make excuses for not doing the right thing, for not obeying him, for not growing in him, for not helping others, for not helping to build his kingdom. We make excuses to justify our actions to make us right with God. But here's the amazing thing. God will excuse us, but there's only one way that he can excuse us, and that is based on justification through faith in Christ alone. So when we try and use excuses to make ourselves right with God, we're trying to do it our way instead of his way through Jesus. It's like saying, God, here is a better excuse than the blood of Jesus. How can we be that bold to go up against the blood of Jesus and go, no, this is a better excuse? So what's it all about? Why would we ever use excuses? And it's because of the temptation that we often think they are a mask or a shield that protects us. We believe that using excuses helps us to not have to face our fears or to get out of doing something we don't want to do or to help us get out of trouble. And we hide behind this mask. We hide behind the shield of excuses because sometimes we think it's just easier than being real and vulnerable or simply accountable. I saw again recently um, a list of the top five fears that hold people back. These are true in life, but they're particularly true when it comes to um, spiritual things in God. And these are the fears that often we use excuses because of, because we don't want to face that fear. Number one, fear of the unknown. The reality is that God is God. He's not a big version of us. And the more that you start to wrestle with who he is and and how he does what he does, you get questions. There is a lot about God that's unknown. And that's why he invites us to an eternity with him, because that's how long it will take to work him out. He's God. He's not one of us. And so sometimes, though, we're scared of that unknown, what he's asking, who he is. And we're like, you know what, I'll just use an excuse because I don't want to face that. We don't like the unknown. Fear of failing. If we're being honest, we're still scared that if we fully trust God, he'll drop us. He will fail us when we most need him. And so we use an excuse to go, I'm just not going to quite give God everything. Fear of success. And this is actually probably more 
common than fear of failing. The fear of success. Many of us are scared that if we fully give ourselves to God, then he's going to take us and do everything he promised. And what he's going to do is change our lives, change the lives of all those around us. And we're actually scared of all that change. We're scared of what a life in Christ with no barriers, no excuses will look like. We don't want him actually shaking up our lives. And we're scared of a successful life in God, the extra responsibility, what it will do to our relationships and our habits and our sins. And so we use excuses to not give everything to God. Fear of rejection, being judged and embarrassed, something that holds us back from often sharing our faith. And fear of being alone and abandoned. It still staggers me how in a church family, everywhere I go, there are still people who will come up and mention that they feel utterly alone knitted into a church family and yet still abs- feel absolutely alone or even abandoned by God. The connection up, they're just not feeling it, and the connection around, they're not feeling it. It still amazes me. Five fears, universal but particularly true when it comes to God, that hold us back, and these are what we draw on, and often we will use excuses to not have to face these when it comes to God. Last year during all the regionals, I shared a workshop on sharing faith. Um, and something during the workshop, what I'd do is I'd actually ask people, what are the things that hold you back from sharing your faith? And people were honest with me and gave me incredible lists of all the things that held them back. Um, and often they were based on these fears, you know, fear of being asked questions that they didn't know the answer to, fear of being rejected, fear of just all these, all these things, good reasons that stood in the way for them not sharing their faith. I then mentioned to them, well, these are good reasons, but there is a word that often you know, is used to describe, and they quickly would cotton on and go, yeah, there are excuses. You see, often we will hold on to good reasons, but the dictionary definition of good reasons that hold us back from something is an excuse. But we often don't like that definition. We prefer good reasons to not do something. But the proper definition is excuses. And then I asked the people in the um, workshop, I would ask them, so are these good reasons, these excuses, these things that hold you back from sharing your faith, are they of God? Are they from God? And immediately everyone would shake their head and go, no. So if something's not of God, then who's it of? There is an enemy of God. And so if something's not of God, then it's from the enemy. And you could see people kind of going, okay, so these excuses aren't of God. They actually hold us back from doing what God wants. So they're actually tools of the devil stopping us doing what God wants. Excuses aren't protecting us. They're actually leading us away from everything good that God actually has for us. Excuses don't protect us. The devil uses them to simply hold us back. There's no protection there. Another way of looking at it is excuses are the plug in the bathtub of our lives. In a bathtub, nothing can fill up if the plug is out. But as soon as you put the plug in, it will fill up, overflow, overflow, do whatever you want. But that plug controls the whole bathtub. And excuses are the same thing in our lives. Our lives cannot fill up with the blessings and the presence and the promises of God if that plug is out, if we're using excuses to not take God as word and do what he says. Good things cannot fill us up while the plug is out and we use them. And the amazing thing is that God constantly always lets us have the power to pull the plug on him by using an excuse. It's amazing that he allows us to do that. The power of excuses um, is one of those ones that, and I, to be very real, there's a couple of stories in my life where excuses really um, hit home for me. So whenever I share this message, and I've shared it a couple of times, um, I'm struck by how I often feel God's preaching to me. I remember the first time that excuses became a feature of my life was I was 10 years old at the South Island Big Camp. That's where I was born and raised. South Island Big Camp, if you haven't been there and seen it, um, all around there are scattered these, these brick bathroom blocks those old nasty bathroom blocks and one day myself and two friends were playing out the back and the grass had just been cut and there are drains that take all the shower water and the basin water and they just open drains out the back and we took some of the grass and we put it in the drain just to watch it get washed away 
And then we realized if we put a bit more grass in, something sort of happened a bit differently. And then we were like, hold it, here's an idea. If we take lots of grass, put it in that drain, it might block up. And then all the water coming into it will have nowhere to go and it will block up the toilets. We're 10 years old. We hadn't thought this through. So we got all this grass and we put it in. We punched it in. We did a really good job blocking up these drains, the men's and the ladies, the ladies and the men's. And we... we